I teach you guys um, how to identify a scam versus a real blockchain and what it's doing by integration and development and how to be durable. I'm a, I've kind of coined this new phrase, you need to become durable in the blockchain space. Um, if you lose your phone, if you have a computer breaks, if there's a flood, um, if you're not durable, if you don't follow certain protocols, you can lose access to your money altogether. And so being able to become durable in the space is also something really important. So I'll teach you guys that. Obviously, this is not going to happen in one lesson. Today, we're just going to do some broad strokes and, uh, and we're going to kind of answer a lot of questions. Um, but I will give you my, my card at the end. You guys can reach out to me and we can do a boot camp or a class to kind of one on one these things so you can understand things a little bit more deeply. But uh, that's what we're here for today. And I believe we're going to get started here. Um, I was a last minute add in, so I apologize for the term. Now, there was no marketing or advertising for my class today. Josh called me this morning and said, hey, we had somebody drop out. Could you fill in? I am the co-host, so I always said I'd fill in for him. So, uh, so this will be a real intimate class. And so if you guys have questions or anything like that, feel free. Um, just so you guys know, I have been uh, researching blockchain for, like I said, about eight years. And I've constructed about, um, let's see, all my presentations. I've constructed about 50 education decks on the topic of blockchain, all of the different uh, ways that blockchain works and how to engage with blockchain over time. Um, I've gone over security devices like treasures, ledgers, concept ideas like our new fundamentals of how we're going to hide this information from digital environments, um, which is truly important. And then I came out with some fundamental value sets. And so before we get started, I need to know what everybody's values are because we, we have to come to some consensus about what blockchain is and how we're going to use it. Um, a lot of people don't understand. Blockchain is just very simply uh, a cyborg encryption of information and then that information is displayed and that, that uh, encryption allows that data to remain sovereign, uneditable. And if it's edited in any way, the code doesn't work and it no longer fits into the cube that it was made for. And so we have a new technology that allows us to digitize something without it being corrupted. And so if you consider our entire world, everything we do, everything you have, um, operated un under some sort of validation state, um, but the validation was done by a third party, somebody else besides you. And that's starting to wane because we're starting to see money leak out of these environments or seep out of these environments, and the infrastructure is starting to weaken because it can't sustain itself. And that's not any nefarious act, I don't believe. Um, I believe our infrastructure was a perfectly appropriate 50 years ago or 60 years ago when we didn't have global access to everything and everybody all at once. But now we're looking at these systems and they're quite arbitrary and they're insufficient and there's um, absorbent cost associated with it because of the manpower needed to keep the structures going. And so, um, I have a little, a little one, a, a little, uh, let me see if these even load, I just realized. I'm trying to get these to load, guys. Let me see, um, I gave this, this one, the human meets blockchain. Um, let's present that one. This one I gave at UNLV. So I actually spoke at UNLV in front of uh, developers and professors uh, regarding uh, what was happening here in the space. And gosh, guys, I'm so sorry if this doesn't load, we might just pull this into discussion, but basically the, the, uh, the concept was this. We have uh, operated on a boom and bust cycle utilizing precious metals for our systems of validation for the past 6,000 years. Um, you can go back all the way to the Roman times and you can see our boom and bust cycles rise and collapse of societies and cultures because of the very mechanism of currency. Um, human beings have done something revolutionary that not many people understand at this time. And the fact is, is that we have invented a way to run a better economy. And that, is, that narrative is slowly starting to eke out into the environment. We're starting to understand it, but it is going to take time. I imagine uh, right now we're in our 10th, no, we're in our 12th year of blockchain being in existence. And we've already seen the US government and many governments adopt the technology. Why are they doing this? Um, isn't it just for criminals? Isn't it just to be used on the dark web? Is it just so people can use malware? Now, the reason why criminals use these things is because they are ironclad. 
They're highly durable, they're reliable, and they can't be altered. If you can use blockchain and leverage it, you can assure you're going to get your money. Um, whereas, I don't know if people realize this, but chargebacks are some of the largest things in the credit card space. That's why we look at 30 and 25% interest rates because they have to compensate for the loss. So this is a mechanism that's currently failing under our feet and it's everywhere. It's integrated into everything we do. MasterCard, Visa, it's all there and it's a failing system. It doesn't actually really work. They've, they've band-aided it with high interest rates to compensate for the loss. And so now that we're looking at blockchain from a different perspective and we're actually starting to use it, I'm gonna load this again, guys, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> like I said, this, this thing should work. I've got Wi-Fi and I've got my iPad here, but um, the internet is not gonna do it. Oh, goody. Okay, so, so the human meets blockchain. So like I said, this is a techno-social cooperative. Uh, we have a new technology and then we have the social interaction of humans and we have to figure out how this is gonna work. And so um, raise your hand if, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys two options and we're gonna kind of figure out what everybody would desire. Um, do you feel like you would like to have an, an immutable voice in our economy towards politics and decision-making in our government? Raise your hand if you'd like to have that. So you'd like to have a voice, right? Do you feel like you have a voice now, um, right? There's a lot of systems in the way and by the time my vote gets read, I don't know if it's being translated into the desires of the people. So I don't feel like I have a voice. So we do want a voice. Um, what about um, custody? Um, do we like to hold our own money or would we prefer to give it to a third party entity that could lock us out of our money, take a percentage of our money or seize our money if, they, if the government chooses? Um, I would prefer to self custody my money. I'd like to hold it under my own control and um, realizing that um, early on so I, I, I'm, my history is this, guys. I started, in, like I said, Bitcoin a long time ago when they were hundreds of dollars each. And I saw the technology and the potential. And so I cashed out my 401k. I said, this, this 401k has been sitting here for 15 years. It's yielded me next to nothing. And so I bought a ton of Bitcoins. And very shortly after that, I was able to retire. And then I realized, wait a minute, something is happening here. I didn't get lucky. There's a movement that's occurring and I needed to explain and teach people what this movement is. And it's a movement off of government environments that validate from fiat currency to gold, manipulatable environments to a sovereign environment with an auditable, uh, that has audits every few minutes, that can't be altered, that is a construct that has a set of rules and there's a consensus that would be required to change those rules instead of just like a few guys behind the curtain changing things. And if that's happening and we're pivoting from our old environment to our new environment, what are we picking? And that's why I ask the questions. Do you guys want a, vo a vote? Do you guys want to hold your own money? How about yielding on your own money while it's in your custody? Can you guys find an environment in our current system where you can hold your own money and it, it gets bigger? Not, not because it gets more valuable, but you actually have $2 and now you have $3. Uh, do you guys have any other way of doing that besides giving your money to a bank or giving your money to a retirement service or handing your money to an IRA or something where it is locked up out of your control. And the fact of the matter is, is there is none. I looked. There is no environment where you can hold your own money and yield interest on it. Now, why does that matter? <clears throat> well, because control is what's important, right? If you own your own money and you have control of your own money, you can do with it what you wish or it goes towards the things that you support. When you're not in control of your own money, a third party entity says, well, we wanna buy more guns and so we're gonna let this business get loans for these guns and, and that's going to be it. And your money is in that pool being lent out through these institutions. So self custody is starting to become something that is really interesting because it allows us to empower ourselves because when we hold our own money, the institutions don't have it and they lose power. And so there's this tipping of the scale that we're starting to see. Um, so what are our values? Our values are to hold our own money, to have a vote, to, have a vote, um, to be able to yield our own money. Um, and we wanna make sure that the blockchains are here uh, to stay. And so we have to evaluate them in a certain way. Um, gosh, you guys, this is really gonna be tough. So you guys know who I am. I've been teaching here for a long time. Um, I have been uh, in this space since the second tech alley. We're going into our, we're finishing our third year really soon. And I have been teaching on this technology. You notice I was probably a little skinnier and leaner in some places because you know, I get chubby during the winter. I love it. 
I eat up all the time. Um, but I've been teaching and I've been introducing this topic. Um, I actually was even one of the first people to utilize blockchain to issue awards uh, to the uh, National uh, Center for Women in Technology. And we were able to mint them an award NFT, the first award that will probably actually grow in value over time because it's coupled into the blockchain. And so um, we were able to do that. Um, I've also worked with the high schools here. And there's a, uh, oh, oops, there's uh, me in a high school pick. Ah, it's going the wrong way. Oh, let's see if the swiping works. Oh boy. So touching is forward and that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can go back. No, let's see, maybe I'll have to go through the whole thing. But my point was is that I've, I've gone to the high schools, we've actually built blockchain servers and for, the, for the kids in their, uh, in their computer classes because it is paramount that the younger generation understand how these networks work and how to properly and responsibly utilize them. Um, we're at a really interesting time, you guys, because we must act for the right change to unfold and we have always existed very complacently and we were able to kind of sit back while the government was able to make the changes for us and we just kind of rolled with them but when you're self custodying your money and you're working on a global network your attitude has to change and it changes for the better because um, you're going to do far better without middlemen extracting your value than you are holding your own value and yielding on your own value so like I said we all have these value sets and if we have these value sets, uh, self-custody, self-custody yield, voting, um, long-term predictability on our ability to use the chain, um, it actually lays out a roadmap of what is usable in the current blockchain space and what is not. Uh, because some chains don't allow for these things. Uh, most chains will not allow you to self-custody and yield on your money. You will have to send it to somebody, it gets locked for a period of time, and as long as nothing bad happens, you will get your money back plus interest. If something bad happens, you'll get smashed. It's called slashing in some environments. And you actually lose your money because you sent it somewhere. And that's silly. So properly designed blockchains will have things that are more symbiotic in nature. They will work with you, and then if you, do not, and if you don't perform, then you just don't, won't get what you could have gotten. If you perform, you get. If you don't perform, you don't. And so this isn't a slashing or a negative attribute. And so how many people have bank accounts right now? And has anybody ever overdrafted their bank account? Right? We've all done it maybe once or twice. And what happens? We get penalized, right? So why did they even let me send that money? It wasn't even in my account. Why did they even let that go through? Why are they slashing me? Why are they penalizing me? And so it actually is a more of a thought process and an ethos of how the systems were designed. Punishment was an integrated part of the design of these systems, whereas properly built blockchains, like I said, will be more symbiotic. Participation will yield results. No participation yields nothing. No penalty, though. And so if we're going to start to look at these, these networks, we have to understand that some of them have inherent vulnerabilities and that is a risk to our money. So if we have environments that are constantly getting hacked, like a DAO hack, or a Zoo hack, or a Bitfinex hack, we have to say, is this where I wanna store my money? In this environment that is potentially hackable, right? So when you're looking for blockchains, you wanna look for blockchains that don't necessarily have a model that allows for people to manipulate it. Um, one of the most important models of manipulation is the ability to burn or print more tokens. Now we are fleeing our current environment, and we are fleeing you guys, we'll talk about the dollar in just a moment, but we are fleeing our current environment for a particular reason. Does anybody know why we have to leave the dollar? Inflation. Inflation, that's exactly correct. So we have an inflationary problem right now. Now, inflation comes because the government has an unchecked ability to print money at will. This is a tokenomics thing. This translates to tokenomics in blockchains. So what kind of tokenomic structure do we want to go into on a blockchain? Do we want to enter a tokenomic structure that mimics the American dollar structure of printing money to infinity? No, we want to leave that behind. We found that this was a problem and it actually resulted in the devaluation of the money that we're carrying. And so we don't want to move into a tokenomic structure that is infinity. So when you evaluate blockchains for use, I urge you to check the tokenomic structure. Is this a cap supply? 
Is this, are they, can they print and burn more tokens at will, manipulating the value of our money like previous? Or is it a fixed supply where money pours into the network and the value has to go up because you cannot manipulate the supply? These are really important things because this will dictate what our system looks like in the future. And remember, we're leaving a system. Yes? How do you, how do you do the research into making sure that it's um, not volatile? It's all, so basically, you're looking for fixed supply when you look at blockchains. It's really easy. And you can check that. You can either use GPTs to help you. Okay. You can go in and say, hey, show me all of the tokens that have a fixed supply. It'll be a very short list. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it'll be a very short list. Okay, and, and then you want to look at self-custody. Which environments let you self-custody your money and self-custody and yield? Once again, a very short list. Okay, oh, good call. I know, I think they're partying out there. We'll party with them. Woo! We, should, we should all go out there and cheer. Yeah! <laughs> the biggest problem I have with blockchain is latency. Yeah, well, that, okay, no, so that was a big problem also when cell phones first came out. Uh, there was huge delays, drop calls were a big problem. This is, a, this is a, a nuance of the early adoption and development of these networks. Things are not streamlined yet. Things are not easy yet. It is the first adopter advantage right now. And so are people working on a streamlined environment? Absolutely. Um, I've seen things like Mithril and Midnight. I've seen stable coins starting to emerge. I've seen UIs that, are, that grandma can use coming out. They're not here yet, but it's coming. And so latency, meaning how many times the coin has to be verified on the network to disseminate across well, the, the network. The, the construct is the time it takes. Right. If I'm doing a central clearinghouse like Visa, mm -hmm. uh, it can do <coughs> about 20, oh, sorry. a billion two transactions a day with latency of less than a second. Right. Right. Blockchain, the latency is so long. Right. And so you have to consider what you're giving up because everything has a trade, right? I know that. Right. And so you're giving up um, convenience and, and speed for independence. Yes. And so if, you, if latency becomes this really hard rock, like, I'm not, I want it to be fast, then you can sacrifice that and no, say, understand. yeah. It's and, and say not that. ubiquitous, though. Yeah, it's not. You need both. Yeah, you yes. do need both. You need a balance is what you yes. need. Yes. You need a quick enough settlement time with the abilities that blockchain allows us. And right now, well, yeah, we have lightning fast settlement on closed environments that yes. are controlled, because that you fee don't us. Have a latency issue right. Because you're verifying right. over a few right. nodes. Mm -hmm. I get that. Mm -hmm. So the fact of the matter is, is latency, although a real concern, there are much greater concerns stacked on top of that desire. And so if we, if we all focus on, well, I want my transactions done instantly, I would rather have a consolidated environment. Then you're going to no, say it's not either or. It's, it's, it's mixed use. Right. It is mixed use. And so, but right now, a lot of people have that perspective solely, though. They're like, well, it takes too long. I don't want to use it. But you understand the fact that it is kind of a give and take, right? Right. And also, yeah. power use, when we have fusion, blockchain will do much better. Right. Well, we do have fusion, right? Well, so, the question if we have cold fusion or, not, or the new. Version. Yeah, the blue laser fusion. Yeah. yeah, they just figured that out. So, fusion is coming, plasma energy is coming, magnetic propulsion is coming. It's how soon? We, yeah, it's how soon. And now, interestingly enough, is with AI coming out, not to go off too far on a tangent, but they said we were 40 years away and now we're four years away because of AI. Because AI is solving a lot of intricate problems that were taking them a lot longer to solve. And so, AI is speeding that process. So, that's good news for all of us. Anyway, so we want to make sure that we're, when we're evaluating these blockchains, we don't don't um, put ourselves in an environment where we're going to lose money. Now, why is that? Why do we care about losing our money? What does our money represent? You know, what is it? Freedom. No, yeah. no, it's a claim on, it's a generalized claim on the goods and services of an extended society. It's a formal definition of money. Right, that's a formal definition of money, but money to you when you earn it represents something more than that. It actually represents your time. No, that's the point. It's, right. If it's the claim on everybody else's time, Right. The money to them is the claim on your time. Correct. No, it's, it's ubiquitous. Right, it is ubiquitous. And so what the biggest concern is that if we adopt systems and use systems that devalue our money, and our money was created over a span of time, and time is the only finite asset that we all truly have individually, some of us have more or less than others, then that means when money gets devalued, quite literally your life is being stolen. Actually, it's not devalued, it's appropriate or whatever yeah same difference it loses its purchasing power yes. so you've lost your life 
because you spent time to develop a purchasing power and now you received it and it's sitting there in your bank account and it's getting lower and lower and lower. That's right. And what people don't understand, yeah, what, what people don't understand is they have literally stole your life. Your time that you took away from your family, fun, and friends to go earn that money and then you put it somewhere and it gets smaller and smaller, all that time you spent away from your family is gone now. Yeah, isn't that interesting? What a concept. No, it's appropriate, it's not lost. It's appropriate. Okay, what does that mean by appropriate? Help me understand. That all goods and services oh. in society are ubiquitously available to all members of the society. Inflation is the appropriation of some of that surplus mm -hmm. to a central authority. And so instead of having taxation and taking your money for central authority, use Oh, inflation. so you think inflation is the money that they take to support the, the government? The claim on the goods and services of society yeah. is an indirect form of taxation. Right, so it's an indirect form of taxation. That's correct. So right now, what are we being taxed on our dollar? Uh, well, uh, we're being taxed uh, the various federal taxes plus inflation. Mm -hmm. Which is? Well, last year, inflation took 7.9% of our dollar. Well, that's a, that's a uh, construct. If you, I mean, it's different for everybody. I happen to own my home, so the housing component doesn't get taken right. from me. Right. Uh, what, so what's your point? I'm just saying that the idea that people act like <sighs> your life is being stolen. It's not. It's, it's fractional appropriation. So you think it's good that your money is No, dies. I didn't say it's good. Oh, okay. Appropriation, I'm not in favor of. Okay. You're speaking in metaphor. Right. Well, I'm trying to, I, I, want to, I want everybody to understand because people don't understand as depth, deeply as you do the appropriation and, and all of the processes that go and how, how it's necessary. Yeah. yeah. Think, you know, at the basic, like, I, I'm a banker, so the, at the, basic, the basic problem is we're dealing with fake money because right. when you put $100 in your checking account, the bank is going to take 90 mm -hmm. and is going to give those 90 to you or 80 to you and, and so and then mm -hmm. so it, it, it's a pyramid scheme right that's it is what it is yeah. right. well, that's so, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. From, yeah. From, yeah. from fractional yeah. banking right. so right. which every bank uses back, from going back to saying okay so my money is my money i have full access to like it's it's all i mean it's it, it's, it's really inflated and fit, right and it so is. but when we talk about inflation too like i think you know, when I was back in school, they would always tell us, you know, the dollar, I think, is still like 80% of transaction worldwide of a yes, dollar. Yes, correct. Right? That's why China, or even the euro, they are trying to make it the most dominant currency. That's in many ways what saves us, because right. if you take countries like Argentina, or many countries that have dual currencies, right, so their currency goes up 3,000%, right, in terms of inflation, I mean, it goes even as much. But then people say, well, but then they, they want to peg it to the dollar, right? right. They don't believe the Chinese currency is still pegged to the it's dollar. It's not. It yeah, that's to, correct. It it's be, not. Right? It used to be. So, so that's why, you know, I, I mean, I understand what everybody's saying, but at the same time, we're, we're, we're leaving off something that is not real. You know? <laughs> you know correct. So even it's a promise. Because I was telling you earlier, like I was following the prices of cars. If you look at Modern Week, of 1982, or even if you look, I was watching at Sears, like the cost of a washing machine in 1982, it was like 499, 599, mm -hmm. which is the same price that would be paid for one today. Mm -hmm. But if you can't count for inflation, it should be like almost two thousand dollars. Correct. So, um, and, and then people will tell you, I'll just finish with that. But people yeah. will tell you the price you sell the good is what people want to buy it for. Are willing right? to pay. That's how you determine the price. Supply demand so I'm it. super confused, that's what I'm saying, because I feel like the more I research it, the more I feel like, you know, everything is sort of fake. Everything, everything, everything up until this point has been fake and manipulatable and alterable without your consensus. Yes. And that's the point because a lot of people are like, well, we're going to digital money. That's actually wrong. <laughs> We've been on digital money for a long right, time. Exactly. We've been on digital money that was closed and controlled by a third party. Now we're going to globally open and transparent digital money that can't be altered without consensus. And so that is the fundamental difference is that now we're in an open and a, a secure environment that cannot be manipulated. So if there are 21 million Bitcoins only, and there are 41 million millionaires in the US that are unaware of Bitcoin, multimillionaires, 
that 21 million bitcoins has to absorb the value of the 41 million millionaires as money starts to move into the environment. And older people won't see it. Younger generation doesn't trust government. They don't trust the dollar. But they it's, see it's, it's dropping. The backup, right? Because right. Before, like, dollar, What's the backup? Well, a dollar was, was, was pegged to gold. Yeah, the dollar just represented so gold at some point. Like, yeah, it yeah. doesn't if anymore. You change the system, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that the 21 million Bitcoin are worth the same today than they will be five years from now. Sure. They're not pegged to anything, but to the value right. that people make of it. No? No, because as, well, see, now, what, I'm sorry, say that again? When we came off the gold standard. 72. Right. 72. 71. 71. Yeah, we came off the gold standard. So we came, so you're right, at one point, the dollar represented gold. In fact, do you guys remember the gold stamp that was on the dollar? You could actually take it to a bank and get a little chunk of gold back then. Yeah, the so, silver. Yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. And so, but here's the theory on it. So China was cashing out uh, dollars in a crazy rate, and they were trying to collect all the gold. Nixon realized this and said, whoa, we've got to stop this. And so by doing that, they, um, they, they de-pegged the gold from the dollar, and then they made a huge announcement saying, hey, we're gonna prove the dollar to the speculators, we're gonna show you how strong it is, and through that mental manipulation, they were able to pull people to not care about the value of something, more of the, the government would gonna take care of us. And were they wrong? I don't think so. I think our government operated differently than it did, does now. I think there was a much closer relationship to the people and the government. I think it's a vast distance now. And so if that's the case, we need to start turning on and utilizing mechanisms where, like I said, we can be heard. We can hold our own money and control where value goes. Um, an example of controlling where value goes is this. Uh, the Ukraine war started and people started to uh, send Bitcoin to people that needed money. And people that needed money got it. They didn't have to go through a donation site. They didn't have to go through anything. They were simply able to perform an action because they wanted to. And that is empowerment. When I say I can stand up and I can send somebody money across the world and help them, instead of sending it to a donation site, and then maybe they'll get food, maybe they'll get rice, maybe they'll get something, but that donation environment is actually gonna get a lot of money too. These are really interesting things that we no longer need. We don't need those third party environments with Bitcoin. and so. I know a lot of people may not agree that money equals our time spent um, away from. Yeah, I, I don't know how anybody could disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how anybody could disagree with that. But yeah. for me, like what we view as as money or as a currency needs to be backed up by something because otherwise, right. how do you determine the value of it? Well, the biggest case of faith in what is valuable and realizing that we have always changed our faith in what we thought was valuable. You exist and were born and live in a time where gold was it. And for a long time, gold was. But we've actually shifted from those things time and time again throughout the world. We had the tulip craze. You know, people favored other things over gold. We've had shifts in consciousness like this, but nothing ever worked because the technology wasn't there and the scope and development didn't exist. Well, now we have supercomputers in our pockets and we can reliably turn on an infrastructure, a digital infrastructure that is immutable, and we can start to use it reliably in this kind of economy. Could we have used Bitcoin 50 years ago? No, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have Wi-Fi networks, we didn't have broadband, we had nothing. And so this is a technology that is standing on the legs of all new technologies, and it is going to create a better economic system that is more trustless, more provable and more durable over time. Why? Because there's no politician that can say, hey, we're making 50 million Bitcoin now. We're gonna turn this up and change it. There is an encryption on it's Bitcoin. A transition and the migration. Right, the that's the biggest uh, thing. Because yeah. I still think what this gentleman was saying is very true, is like, you know, there is no, so the interest rate were like zero for the longest time. Right. But now the question is who's benefiting from the interest rate being at, you know, the government, right. because all of a right. sudden everybody has to Kind of pay more. Right. Well, 15% was the stock market, and they returned 1% to us. So, and that's the biggest problem. Yeah. on top of it, if the government is 5.5%, the end of the bank, they take an extra 2% on top, and you're credit card. Right. Oh, even worse, right? And then all the fees you have. And so the, the environment itself 
um, needs to become extractive just to sustain its in itself. Yeah, it's its transition. Right. Yeah. And so if yeah, but the only thing that I'm concerned with honestly, I, I love what this conversation is fantastic. I'm learning more than I have in like weeks. Oh, sweet. The thing is that the volatility is the only thing that's very concerning. Correct. So the thing is, is that I want to make sure that I have a concrete system where if I invest my 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 capital, I want to know that it's it's it's, it's gonna return, but it's also not gonna fall. That's one of the things when I see Bitcoin where it's all over the place, excuse me, right. it's all over the place. It is. And it just makes you extremely nervous. It does. And so when you see that stuff, like you use, I understand what you're saying, what your message is, but when I see that, it doesn't connect, it doesn't right. correlate. You right. know what I'm saying? So we it have, makes me a little bit nervous as yeah. and I want, I want more understand more about how right. you see there's a stable coin. What does that look like? How, right. how, how do we get to that point? Because so that, so that I know that I'm going to say. Super excellent question. So right now, because everything is launching, and we are launching, it's still new. it is still very, very new, and the OGs, we call them, mm -hmm. the old systems, are actually really attacking Bitcoin. They're attacking the... Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. yeah. Because, because yeah. you came from a speculative system, yeah. no matter what, and we all benefit right. from it. Okay. We, we so benefit from it. It's right. supposed to be not speculative at all. Right. So that's what I'm saying, like your transition Right. So the reason why we're getting these fluctuations is because big business, big companies are buying it and systematically selling it off at certain times to fear people out. Now, they're trying to accumulate all of it. They're, they're trying to accumulate all of it. Yeah. So, so there's a civil war here right now happening around the world, and it's a global civil war to separate money from government. So there's three things that should never be tied together because they're all power forces, religion, government, and money. And somehow over time, we have squashed religion and government has accumulated money. And that is a problem because now they're starting to overreach because they have the power to. But it's like a pyramid scheme. It is because there's no real value floating. There's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so, right, I love that movie. Crushing the retail. Crushing all, yeah. crushing all the on purpose. Yeah. And then folks got on Reddit, started talking to each other, and they're like, screw this. If we have enough of the little guys that go in and Bam. this, we'll bring the stock price back. Early and they did. Out. And so Early the big institutions, out. because they were saying, hey, it's going to come down, we're going to make a lot of money on the right. on we'll short the these guys. top of the stock, <laughs> because all the little investors came in and bought it, they yeah. pushed their calls, and so right. they lost and so the and so the truth is this, right? We have we. No, you didn't know. I watched trailers for movies. My buddy, my okay. I worked in the hospital when this is going on. I worked in the hospital and I had friends that were in the GameStop thing and they're like, we're not selling, we're crushing those bastards because it was a retirement firm. Yeah. And what they were doing was they were betting that retail was going to get scared out and they were going to crush them on shorts. And they, they kept getting crushed, they kept getting crushed. And then one day this guy was like, man, if we didn't sell, they would lose the money. And so he started a YouTube channel. He got all these people together and he said, look, don't sell. If you sell, these institutions are going to short us and we're going to get screwed. If you hold, we break them. Because you could see all the shorts the institutions were putting in. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, and now, now yeah. Yeah. And so, so right now we're in a really interesting spot because we can actually do the same thing on blockchain. The institutions are doing it again, but they're doing it bigger. They're buying tons of blockchain, they're crashing the market, and then when it's low, guess what they're doing? Buying right back up. They scare you out, and then they accumulate the hard asset that can't be manipulated. Yeah, and so, it is a speculation, but what's really interesting is that you can see the orders. You can actually go online and you can see these orders are placed to short this, and they're all large institutions and they're all large money orders, and so we can speculate but we can also verify. And that's how they figured out the GameStop issue. And then we realized that businesses do this as a norm. This is their operating structure. They've been doing it as a norm. And guess what? It's approved and it's okay. You know why? Because those institutions have an obligation to give profits to their investors. And if it so means... It's when he explains it yeah. to understand. Like, you yeah. watch TV on Fox News or something, and I'm like, yeah. I have no idea about it. Yeah, and so it if so it's okay to do it in this world, and I'm like, whoa, 
Why is it okay to crush the small guy or crush the retail investor that's just trying to get ahead? This is not okay. And so no, when you... That's the, that's right. the twist, which right. is if you give your money to... A third party. Price yeah. And then we'll take percentage. Okay. I'll tell you. Yeah. And instead of you getting all your money that you deserve, they take a chunk. And that is not right. So blockchain allows you to store, hold, and yield on your own money and capture 100%. Because blockchain is not a product. Blockchain is not a, a tinker. It's a communication network that is expanding every day. Now, I did the math. It was expanding at $20 million per day pouring into the blockchain market. 14 ETFs just got approved by the US government. The expansion has grown to 700 million per day. So I did some math. Actually, I think my note is in here. I was trying to calculate um, how quickly we could see God, I got tons of notes, guys. Um, how quickly we would see Bitcoin hit a million per token. And so let me see. Oh, gosh, I don't know where that note is. is current that current inflows. No. Uh, demand. Okay, so I was, I, was, I was doing some math, and I was trying to figure out the current inflows. Actually, this, this one won't work either, so we'll just go back to the other one. But um, the current inflows of the money and what it would do to reflect the price. Now, a lot of people are like, well, you really can't do that because there's manipulation and this and that. And I said, no, 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 there's no manipulation in the quantity. And we're talking about basic fixed quantity and then value pouring in, which means you can't make more slices of a pizza. So the only thing that can happen is the value increases. Okay. So if you could divide a Bitcoin and make more Bitcoin, so we got 22 million, 23 million, then when money pours in, we could desaturate that. Bitcoin, right. Right, and so we'll be working on fractions of Bitcoin. But the fact of the matter is, is that 300 million per day times 365, you're gonna get about $100 billion. Uh, what's that? Um, oh, yeah, okay, so it rained. Yeah, it is good, I'm glad you are. I'm glad you are, and so I didn't, I didn't clarify that. So we've had days of 300 million, 500 million, and 700 million. Forget the five and 700s, I'm gonna always underestimate. I'm gonna say our lowest, our lowest day of 300 million per day off of our old 20 million a day since the ETFs got approved. 300 million a day means 100 million, oh, I mean, a, a, a 100 billion by the end of the year. So if we do that, it's simple math. 21 million into the current environment with the tokenomics of Bitcoin, that's a million dollar Bitcoin. So what's really strange is this is not my numbers. This is ARK Investing, this is Vanguard, this is BlackRock. They're all suggesting with the inflows that we're looking at right now, we'll see a million dollar Bitcoin by the end of the year. They are the, the, the scary yeah. And they are, they are the biggest players, yes. I two trillion dollars to drop into So, so, and that is so true because remember, we're looking at, we're looking at a global network and we're seeing these US businesses do this and they're looking at pushing the money, but here's the fact. As it gets more valuable, the rest of the world will start to pile in. And so we need, it's really important that we leave this centric US perspective and step back and say, wait a minute, we have countries that are adopting it as legal currency. The Swiss just opened an EPT for it to be traded on their stock market. They rang the bell yesterday. There's three exchange traded products in other countries for these blockchains, which means the government is going to do what the government is going to do, and they're gonna allow access to the American people to have this product through the, through the lines they're comfortable with, well, right? It started, with the, it started with the big boys, right, to be fair. So, right, right. the big boys went to the government and said, right. hey, we make some Oh, that's what they're doing. They're trying to use it as a product, and then, yeah. And then the government, yeah. all our governors who are owned by this guy, right. go, oh yeah, okay, my question is hard for the retail for us to, to access a little it. person yes, exactly. to, to, you know, I throw 10 to 20 grand or whatever. Right. right. Yes, sir. Because are they doing this across all blockchain type, including Bitcoin, but Ethereum? And so here's what we do we talk about our ethos, right? Our value set. Yeah. There are many blockchains that are out there. Um, I started with Bitcoin and I dev on Bitcoin. I built nodes on Bitcoin. I learned how it worked. Um, then Ethereum was announced and 
happiest guy on the planet when I heard about a, a blockchain with smart contracts. And then I started to dev on it and I realized it was made terribly. It was written in Solidity. There's, it's hackable on every direction with smart contracts. It, um, it creates a class system by their gas fees. So I'm a multimillionaire, you're not and I want my transaction to go through, I'll throw 10 Gs on it, it goes through now. You can't afford that, you're gonna to have to wait a day or two for your transaction to go through. So gas fees dictate time with which things are settled. Yeah, and so what we need to do is realize that not all blockchains are built the same, even though they're using SHA-256 hash encryption ledger technology, they're using it, but then they built all of these weird mechanisms in it, and some of them mimic our system that we're fleeing. So why would we adopt anything that mimics what we're fleeing? So what's the tokenomic structure for Ethereum? No idea. That's infinite. Yeah, it's the infinite. You can print and burn as many tokens as you want. Why are we leaving the American dollar? Inflation. Because they can print and burn money at will. So my question is why right. isn't that already? Why isn't what happened? Why isn't Bitcoin gone to a million already? Because railways for adoption were not in place. Example. Um, when, when I first started, yeah, when I, when I first started, so the, rail, the railways for adoption, so how do you get Bitcoin? Well, now you get Bitcoin by grabbing your phone, going to Coinbase, downloading it, linking a card, you got Bitcoin in two seconds. Ten years ago when I started, I had to write a letter to China, open an escrow account, submit that letter, I had to wait 15 days, and in, and in 15 days, they sent me my Bitcoin in a private wallet that was across the world. It was the only way. The infrastructure for adoption was not there. Now the infrastructure is here. And so what we're going to see is it took 10 years to get all of these apps, dApps, um, approvals through the U.S. government and gateways to open. Now the perspective of the world needs to change. And all of a sudden they pick up their phone and go, I want Bitcoin. And that's why we're going to see a million because we're, we all have access to it right on our phones. Well, and also because, mm -hmm. you know, you're saying that right now it's available for ETFs, but... Yeah, EPTs of yeah, all but, types. But banks, if you wanted to buy Bitcoins through a bank, through your regular checking account... Can't do that. Could not, but now you, if you access Vanguard, ETFs, or, you know, then, then you can do that, which opens right. it up to a lot more. Right. Yeah, I'm not so comfortable with the idea that Wells Fargo holds my account that I hold my Bitcoin in. Like, there's almost sort of the... They're, they're doing it for the... They're doing it for profit. Right. Just, yeah. like, just like any institution will do it. So it always goes back yeah. because we were talking right. about inflation. Right. And I'm not being you know, disingenuous, but what really creates inflation? I, I would like to know because for me, it's almost man-made. It, it is. It is. No, it, it's 100% designed. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like you have companies, the stock goes up, nobody really knows why. If people knew why, you would have analysts, you know, if you just have to watch right. back old videos. Or the stock comes back to value. Yeah, it, it, the stock market fluctuates in the way it fluctuates because of pure insider information. Well, and actually, so <laughs> I've learned also that, you know, 80% uh, of stock market transactions are done through AI systems, which were algorithms Absolutely now. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Don't so try and trade. Exactly. You'll lose every time now. So, uh, AI is in there yeah. beating you. They're beating you every time. Ago, this is the only way. Blockchain. Hiring these people who just write code and, and would say, so AI usually is a language. So, so, so they would say, for instance, okay, if Wells Fargo stock goes down by 10% today and Bank of America and this and this and that, they would have all those conditions, then you sell my stock. Right. So all right. those scripts are written mm -hmm. and they're triggered. That's why, you know, when something happened in the stock, usually it just snowballs. If right. Yeah. It's stock, a trigger effect because this algorithm saw this right. algorithm, saw right. this algorithm. So yeah. is like, that is not speculation. <laughs> yeah. And so basically the whole, the whole meaning, the whole meaning of that is basically the systems that we are indebted to, the ones that we are locked into, they're actually highly manipulated and corrupt in a yes. lot of ways. And so how do we usurp this environment, this government controlled environment? Do we go to the pound or do we go to the Swiss franc or the yuan? No, we get out of government controlled money altogether and we go into globally decentralized money that is exchangeable across the planet, accessible by you 24 seven in your control. A lot of, somebody was talking to me about, oh, FDIC insurance. So I just checked on FDIC insurance. They already made an announcement, an official announcement. They do not have enough money to cover um, closing accounts. So they said they can give you 
$1 for every 100,000 that you have stored. FDID announced this in writing. What about 250,000? Check it out. They don't have it. They already said, we're really sorry. We don't have it. We've been audited. We do not have it. We can give you one per 100,000. And that's, and it was a notice and it sat there. And well, I was looking at the for notice. A, for a Silicon Valley bank, they went above. Yeah, maybe. Maybe there so are some other it, environments. It, 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 yeah. It could be all. Yeah. So the fact that they went above the rule, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. And, and so for it's a still a risk. Here, if right. that scares you, you can layer your money for different banking institutions to right. have to diversify. Right. Anywhere, right? Because the FDI, yeah. yeah, the FDIC also released a list la uh, five years ago, and a lot of my information is old, but it's still growing. The FDIC released a list of closing banks and they're closing by the thousands per day. I didn't even know we could afford to close thousands of banks per day, but banks are closing and consolidating into just a few right now. That's happening now. Go to the FDIC website, go to the bank closure list, and you will see the ridiculous and list. Yes. Credit unions are privately owned. I'm not sure about Those that. Are, yeah, that's so a good question. And they're small and independent. Yeah. Because the old, the institutions will not market this. They will not put it on the news. Hey, listen, I was in a hospital for 25 years. And the tail end before I, yeah, I retired from medicine after oh, I got into debt. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, I worked in a hospital for 10 years. I, I saw patients. So I was in an ER, and, and when I was sitting in this remote ER, um, I would sit there, you know, no patients are coming in at night, and I'd watch TV, and we always had the finance channels on. And every single time, on every single news channel, I would see Bitcoin in red. Bitcoin is falling. Bitcoin in red. And then I'd look at my stuff, and I'd say, Bitcoin just went up $20,000 last week. It went down a thousand dollars, and it's in red. So they're not trying to pump a narrative that, hey, this thing was a dollar ten years ago, and now it's seventy thousand dollars today. They don't want people to see that. They want to flash red. This thing is falling, it's dropping, and it's risky. And they are promoting every type of negative attribute that I can. There's this guy on there. He he, he has like the sound effects. And he goes, sell, 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 buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. Yes, <laughs> mad money. Okay, so he will tell you over and over and over and over again, don't buy Bitcoin, don't touch Bitcoin, it's dying. And so did Jamie Dimon. About eight years ago, Jamie Dimon came on the public space and he's like, if anybody in my workshop buys Bitcoin, you're fired. I will fire you. This is a nonsense a asset. It's rat poison times squared. That was actually from somebody else. But he's like, it's terrible. Don't do it. And later on, we find he had institutions under his name that were purchasing Bitcoin aggressively after he was making that statement. Why? It dropped the price. The price was dropping like crazy. And so he was buying it. And so what we need to understand is those large institutions do not have your best interests at heart. They will quite literally lie right to your face and say, don't do it while they're doing it. It's not for you. It's for me. And so they're trying to keep people out of this environment by not marketing it by not talking about it. And when they do, it is by sure and by far a negative. And so here's my perspective. Sure. I got into it, like I said, about 10 years ago, and I've seen nothing but green. This stuff grows very rapidly. It compounds on itself and there's nobody taking any fees. I control my money. And it's very strange. I have forgotten about the power of compounding value. I get a deposit every five days in my blockchain wallet. And then my next deposit is predicated off of that deposit. And so I get another deposit. And so it's a higher deposit next time. And it's a higher deposit next time. You guys know how fast money grows when that happens? It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous because I started with $50,000 and I won't even tell you how much I have now because the value of the token is going up because of use. I know the value, the value of the, the value of the token is the value of the token is going up and it's compounding. You guys, that's okay, very so powerful. Lost any money. That so What's, oh, I've never lost any money because I focus on security. I focus on how to identify the networks. Yeah. And so when you're focusing on networks, you have to, these are the pillars, guys. Are you ready for the, for the stuff? Okay, I'm going to start this one again. I'm going to tell you how to identify networks. I have five pillars. Um, let me go back here. Uh, this, is a, this is a private thing that I do for my classes. But you can always go through it with me over and over until we do it. Hold on, let me get you to the pillars and I'll, I'll explain them. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Somebody should have wore a body camera. 
Okay, um, a lot of facts here that we went over that we really don't need to understand. Um, I did discuss the mechanisms of, of this technology and the things that work and the things that don't. So one of the biggest things that does not work is proof of work. Uh, proof of work is a competitive dynamic that requires money and utility. Bitcoin runs off of this system called proof of work. So now we have these gigantic mining farms competing all over the world to mint Bitcoins, and they're not being dis dispersed evenly throughout the public. They're being dispersed just primarily to the miners. This is a minor flaw in the design of Bitcoin. The whole concept idea was everybody would start mining at once, Bitcoins would be distributed across the planet evenly, but that's not what happened. What happened is a few technical groups got together and started forming mining farms. And in essence, there are three large farms that can control Bitcoin if they ever decided to unite. And so that could be a flaw in the network. And so although we love Bitcoin because it has a fixed supply, it does have a network layer that could be vulnerable in the future if they don't figure out a way to diversify or decentralize even further. But we do know there is a fixed supply. And so we do like Bitcoin because it can act as a store of value. Ethereum came out shortly after that. And they jumped on the bandwagon with the, um, with the concept of move fast and break things. Hey, if I'm going to make a phone, move fast, break things. If I'm going to make a car, move fast and break things. When you're playing with my money, do not move fast and do not break things. Yeah. I don't want to lose my money in that type of environment, and I don't want that ethos. It also has no max supply, and it uses proof of work. It just switched to proof of stake. It, it, it went to delegated proof of stake. And so people are like, well, this network Cardano has proof of stake, this network Ethereum has proof of stake, they're the same, that's not true. They use the same phraseology, but under the hood, it's a totally different mechanism. Proof of stake on Ethereum, you send your money to somebody, it's locked for two years, if anything bad happens, you lose money. Cardano, you keep your money in your own wallet, you lock it under cold storage and it generates interest right in your hands. So these are differences, they're both called proof of stake. They're both called proof of stake. So what okay. happened with FTX, you know, the guy in yeah. Bernie? So have you ever heard of um, Bernie Madoff? Yeah. Okay. So FTX is Bernie Madoff. It's a bad person utilizing a good institution concept and stealing money from people. So how would you have... It has nothing to do with blockchain. Is there a way that you could have known that? I did know it. I won't send money. I won't send any blockchain money to any institution for any reason. I, I oh, hold so my own money. Working as a third party. Yeah, yeah. He, so he was using the concept or idea of blockchain just like people want to raise their value of their business so they slap AI on it. Blockchain was new and he said, hey, send me your money, send me your blockchain money, I'll store it for you, it'd be really easy. And then he actually made a trading environment using the backing of that money, which was highly illegal. So this is a man. Yeah. And losing it. <laughs> Right, and push it. Right. And so what we need to understand is human beings, human beings are part of the calamity of why this is such a problem. And that's why these autonomous networks that require consensus to work are far better. I don't want Bernie Madoff or the next Bernie Madoff managing my money or holding my money. I honestly don't want Vanguard doing it either. But it's okay because they're giving people access to this asset and that's great. It's going to help their wealth. But the true people that are going to make change in this current environment will be the individuals that self-custody. And you will start to hear that over and over and over again. You really should self-custody. You really need to learn the responsibility of self-custody. And so we have that first generation Bitcoin, we have second generation Ethereum, move fast, break things, no limits. It's copying some of the very mechanisms we're leaving, right? And so then we have Cardano. Cardano has the most PhDs working on it out of any blockchain in history. There's over 50 plus doctorate degrees in finance, cryptology, mathematics, philosophy, banking, and the economy working on this network. They've written over 200 research, peer-reviewed research papers to create an economic system that not only can scale but preserve individuals' liberty. Yeah. I think it's not accurate. Look how old this is. In yeah, eight, that's yeah. What is it now? So um, I believe it's like sixty-seven cents right now. And so what happens is these things move like chameleons. They go like this, and you get so bored you just end up looking away. But what you're missing is through this ebb and flow, it's slowly moving up only. So it's just recovering over time. Would you buy Cardano, for instance? Yeah. yeah today. Coinbase, Cardano. It's in the Coinbase wallet. 
you meet with me, we construct a private wallet for you on the side, you get that money out of that environment in your own custody. That's what I do. Yeah. So that's what I do. I teach people I teach people the process. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So um so basically the rules of engagement are this. We have the responsibility as people now to look at the networks that we're going to use and really realize this will be the future with which we interact. So if we want high fees, high hackability, and inflationary mechanisms, choose certain networks. Choose Ethereum, because that network contains all of those components I just mentioned. If you want a sovereign network designed by people who care about the individual and want to dismiss the overreach of government, you want a network that self-custodies that self-custody and yields, which is so powerful. I can't believe people have, are missing this. To be able to grow your own money in your own wallet is a revolution and nobody seems to get this yet. And also to be able to vote and to be able to control the funds. Yeah, voting is amazing. Yeah. So I see what you're saying, but what do you mean? Like walking through what do you mean by voting? Political voting. Oh really? So, oh yeah. Like yeah. election for the coin? No, so so in in these environments, in these environments. Oh, there it is. That's in, so 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 picture this. So picture this. You and I, we hop on one day on a Zoom. You mint an identity token. You stick that identity token in your wallet. Sure. You go to, um, let's say you want to, um, Cardano's having a new group of developers that want to build on the network and they're going to issue them money. You, because you're a participant in the network, you can actually vote to see who gets those funds to perpetuate the Cardano network further. And right now, Cardano, it is very cool because you get to choose how successful the network is. Doing your own research. And so what's really interesting in that is we've seen Bitcoin or we've seen Bitcoin prevail, but you guys know the first couple of years Bitcoin was out, there was over 9,000 other blockchains out there. Now, there, then a few years later, there was 20. And now I don't even know how many there are. And so it seems to me like an attack is happening to hide sovereign value by masking it with a whole bunch of mess. It's all junk. It's all getting hacked, crashed and dumped. And everybody walks away from the whole thing thinking there's nothing in there. But there's, re there's real value in there. And so, like I said, what you need to do is learn how these mechanisms work, yeah. learn where the jobs are, learn where the, how to make money in, and then start to use them. If you guys want a $60,000 a year job, I can get you one right now on Catalyst. They're looking for advisors. You don't even have to apply. You do the work, you get paid. You don't do the work, you don't get paid. There's no boss, there's no time limit, there's no nothing. So there's jobs out there in these environments to perpetuate them. And not a lot of people know because they're brand new. A lot of these things just released a couple years ago. And so we're developing this right now. And so you want to hold your own money, you want to make sure that you can yield on your own money, you want to make sure you have a vote, and you want to make sure that the chain will be here tomorrow. And that's my last topic because we're running out of time. If the chain is going to be here tomorrow, it has to have resiliencies. It has to have perpetual funding. We can't count on people coming in every day, putting money in so we can keep going. So Cardano has built a treasury within the network. Every transaction that moves throughout the network, a fraction of a penny goes into a treasury. So Cardano, how much is, how much is in their treasury right now? No, yeah. Yeah. So Cardano, yeah. So Cardano in their treasury has almost 4.5 billion to produce new development for the chain. So other chains have died in the past because they simply ran out of money. Cardano has a mechanism and institutions that will perpetually move it forward forever. And so when you want to put your money into something, you want to make sure that chain doesn't die next year, right? So Cardano has three EPTs across the world for uh, traded traded funds, and it just got the ETF through Bitwise as well. So we're looking at global adoption starting to finger in with Cardano because it's cheap, it's ultra secure, it's got perpetualness, so it, it'll sustain over time. You can vote on it. And they're starting to see all of these mechanisms as very valuable in the current world. Not a lot of people are seeing it because we're pretty complacent and we like things to be easier. Yeah, what's your question? Do you anticipate momentum on it once, once this kind of catches up? 
catch it on with more people seeing Cardano, you might have it, like you said earlier, it's kind of crawling along, and all of a sudden it's just going to spike because all of a sudden it's like, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing it. Because when I was researching Cardano, it was at two cents. When was this? Uh, 2017 when I bought. Seven years ago? Yeah, seven years ago. Oh, and so, and so. And so what's really interesting about, I know I bought Bitcoin at 100, I bought Cardano at 2 cents. And so it's, it's, be, it's because I keep seeing these things and no one sees them and then they're unfolding. And so I said, I got to get out here and start talking to these people so people can join the party. Because the fact of the matter is, guys, and I'll end with this, the global blockchain space only is, is about $2.5 trillion right now, total. And our global economic infrastructure is $400 trillion. So we're at $2 trillion. We're going to 400 trillion because blockchain will start to absorb all value in the current economic system. Why? Because the other entities and environments, they lose money every single day they're awake. They're sucking money out of their system because they have employees, they have retirement funds, they have sick employees, they have infrastructure, they have buildings, they have all this stuff. It is. And it, and it makes no sense that people are saving their money in a depreciating asset that's dying by close to 10% a year. And it's going to accelerate, especially when they print more money. So I have a, I have a kind of, and this is kind of paranoid thought, but this just crossed my mind. What happens when the power goes out? <laughs> well, that's interesting because if the power goes out, you're not transacting with anything. You're certainly not using your Visa card. Yeah. You're certainly not using any other means. So there are bigger problems. But what's really fun is as long as you have solar and a battery and cell, you can still transact on Cardano without there being any internet. Right. You can do what's called direct transactions and they settle later once the internet comes back on. And that's a part of a design um, in the, in the uh, ecosystem. So we've actually covered that. And Cardano, I think, is the only emer world emergency, uh, it, it's the only uh, blockchain that has a world emergency system employed where if a comet strikes the earth or power goes out, it'll still function. They had to write it up to get approval from certain governments. And so they created these things, if you can believe it. Well, that's crazy. Yeah. So, that's an advertisement, huh? It is, I mean, I'm telling you, if things go real bad, you'll still be able to use it. <laughs> What's up, bud? So how about that blockchain for music? I guess, um, oh, so. blockchain. So everything is going decentralized and independent. So right now there's um, programs out there, something called Noom. Um, Noom, I would look that one up. They have decentralized uh, musicians. If you want to construct your music, you can NFT the music, you can upload it to a store, and when people buy it, you make money. And so it allows, it, it, what it does is it takes the movie studio out of the environment and it gives it all to the creator. Yeah. The blockchain part of what we have here, we're also using AI to create the videos. And exactly. Yeah, I use ai.invideo.io, and all I have to do is type in a... It, is it me? Yeah. It's better stuff. It's so good. But anyway, I just put in a text and then it makes a whole video for me now. And so um, I, I made a video on YouTube actually. And I used. Let's see. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, gosh. But if I can say that in the intro, even if you have a regular checking account, yeah. periodically you should download your statements, your previous statements. Absolutely. Because things potentially can be changed behind the scene. And then Absolutely. Have you ever have you ever seen that experiment? Yeah. Have you ever seen that experiment where they um, they have you look at something and there's like a bear walking through the room and you don't even see it and then they replay the video and they're like, there was a bear walking through and you missed it. Human beings are really terrible about distinguishing differences when we're looking at stuff after a while. And so they could easily make changes without you realizing it and you would never know. On the blockchain where things are locked, that can't happen. And so we've probably been manipulated in more than a few ways, but um, well, yeah, and that's the whole point. So music, we're going to music here. So I made this song with AI. Um, <laughs> I made it a whole video with this whole video was AI, but um, but um, I wanted to I wanted to show you the song. It was crazy. Yeah. So all I said was. So there's a whole song there. It's a little bit longer, but. It's not. And all I did was type in the prompt. I said, this girl lost her money. She made a mistake. Um, this is something I wanted to teach people about. Make a song about this error. And I gave it the script to the movie. And then it wrote that song. 
And, and so, yeah. This was only the, uh, like the lyrics part of it, and I didn't see any other characters. Oh, characters yeah, this, this video is actually a, a, a mistake that I want to teach people about. It happens all the time. Check it out. It's one minute. All done by AI. In my excitement, I logged into my wallet to show him a live transaction. I didn't realize my private key was briefly. Yeah, it's all AI. <laughs> I opened my wallet to check my balance, and to my shock, it was nearly empty. Tears in my eyes, I confronted Jake. He avoided my gaze, his silence confirming my worst fears. I learned a hard lesson about trust and privacy. My passion for crypto hadn't changed, but I realized the importance of vigilance and personal security. I decided to start over. More cautious, wiser, and ready to face the crypto world again. But this time, on my own terms, mistakes were made, but they won't define me. I'm stepping forward with newfound strength and a resolve to secure my digital future. Remember, your security in the crypto world Watch is weird. Watch the photo on that table. Never share your private key. It's funny. <laughs> So I was excited about this video because it was all done by AI. Every bit, the voiceover, the script, everything. All I did was tell it. It constructed that video. I went to a website, made this song, and I posted it. So this is the power. It used to take me a week to make a video and let alone have a song, no way. So we also have Tara. She is the uh, AI expert in the group. She'll be teaching. So. Be looking for her class so you can learn how to do cool stuff like this. I don't know if you're doing exactly that, but it's you know, use cases for AI. It depends on kind of how the, the exercise goes, but yeah. the text the video. Um, yeah, Veep.io is the one that I'm using right now, um, but it's the same thing. And I basically created a commercial for right. a right. pretend rock climbing thing. And other than changing like two, I did two video edits and a thumbnail for it, and it was that. And I'm like, that's amazing, the right? The whole thing wrote the script. So have you been able to, like I said, it's a terrible spelling. <laughs> right, um, there was no spelling. If you edit the images, it doesn't spell. Right? Yeah, no, you right. can edit the images now, can't yeah. have it. Um, okay. allows you to be able to take the video images, and then it'll extract, it has a tool, you bring up the image and just say extract the words. And it'll and put in good ones. the words, and then you can read it. The only problem with that is that it doesn't, like if you're doing it out of Dolly or mid -journey. It doesn't actually, the font may not match exactly what the other original font was, but it's pretty close, you know. Right, so it's, it's pretty, pretty good. Close. But then you can edit the words and stuff like that. I did that for a graphic for um, a customer of mine, client of mine, where we were creating the image and it came through and, like, you know, numbers weren't the right numbers and stuff. And right. It's all editable. I was all, I was purposefully I was purposefully racing to be super lazy, and I wanted to see what I could really get up and, and published. And so that was my test video. It was lesson one. You saw that, but it, it was enough. It was enough. It, it gave a good message. Yeah. So. What made that again was just the the song, the last song that we did, and I wanted to do create the blockchain with that song. I've been putting it up on like TuneCore, and they would go on. Spotify and all that stuff. Okay. But at the end, I wanted to, um, to try the blockchain with this last song we did. Give um, it a shot. Noom. I'm, I'm competing with, you guys are familiar with our fans of Neo. Yeah. Oh, cool. My nephew, one of my brother's oldest son. Oh, okay. oh wow, so that's I'm fantastic. Yeah, I'm trying to do it on this you know, poor man's budget. <laughs> Well, guys, I know we went a little long, and I do apologize for that. The biggest thing um, I wanted to also go over is seed phrases. Um, right now, when blockchain started, there were 12-word seed phrase wallets. They went to 15-word seed phrase wallets. Now there are 24 seed phrase wallets. When you guys meet up with me, we're going to be building 24 seed phrase wallets. It takes a trillion queries till the end of time to bust one wallet, um, or a trillion, a trillion queries per second till the end of time to break these wallets. It's the most secure place in the universe is what they're saying. And so meet with me and we'll get it done. If you guys want my card, I'll yes. give you my QR and then you guys can uh, set, a set up a schedule with me. Just scan, uh, scan the QR. Yeah, I don't have a physical card. But uh, I'll teach you guys how to walk away with an array, a blockchain wallet array that is unbeatable.